Hello all Royal Rangers, my name is Commander Matthew Kenslow and I'm over here in the United States of America and I've been a Royal Ranger for 20 years and year number 7 as a commander. Thank you so much for checking out this video. The purpose of this video is to go over a merit. In these videos I'm going to walk through every one of the requirements. Now it's important to note that while watching these videos it will not give you the merit. You have to show to your commander that you have watched and learned from these videos. What I recommend you doing is taking down notes for each requirement and then show them to your commander for approval. Some of the purposes of Royal Rangers is to build knowledge, wisdom, skills, and leadership attributes while learning about God's word and conserving his resources practically. And most importantly, to have fun doing it. So I'm Commander Matthew Kenslow from the United States of America and be blessed. Hi everyone, welcome to the Compass Merit. Let's begin with Requirement 1. List the two main types of compasses. So here are the two main types of compasses. You have the base plate compass, because you have the base plate right here, and the compass right there. This is really good for maps, like if you're doing orienteering, or if you're using a map, this is a very good tool to use. And then you have the lensatic one. You open it like this, and it's called lensatic because it uses a lens right there. And you would hold it like this. And you could shoot a bearing, meaning that you point this at a particular object and be able to find what the bearing is. But more on bearings later and what that means. And that's kind of been all what you're going to see in this video with the lensatic compass. But you could always learn more about it elsewhere if you're interested. It is a very interesting tool. But what we're going to be using most often are these, the base plate compass. Okay, let's move on to requirement two. List the four main parts of a compass. So here are the four main parts of a compass. You have a rotating ring, and this is called the bezel or the housing. Inside, you have a magnetic needle, so that's another part of the compass and it always points north. Outside here, you have another arrow, and this is called the direction of travel arrow. It's named that because once you find the bearing and get this compass oriented, this points you in the direction that you're traveling. For the fourth and final main part, I'm going to bring out this compass because this one really shows the orienting arrow. Now, you can see an arrow inside here, and it shows north and south. And this is called the orienting arrow, and when you take a bearing, which we'll talk about later, you're going to rotate the compass so that the magnetic needle is inside the orienting arrow right here. And it's used for orientation so that you can orient the compass after you find the bearing, but more on that later. Just to say, you can still use this. This is somewhat like an orienting arrow because the orienting arrow points to the north in the housing right here. Okay, requirement three, list the eight major directions and their bearings. So let's start with the cardinal directions. These are the number one important directions that I'm sure that you're familiar with, north, south, east, and west. Let's begin with north, and by convention, let's put it up on top. If this is north, then the opposite is south. So north and south is pretty easy, but how do you know which one's east and which one's west? Well, I want you to think of the phrase, never eat slimy worms, or never eat soggy waffles. And there's more out there, but this is a mnemonic or a easy memory tool for you to use in case you forget. Now, I want you to think of what clockwise means. Clockwise means that you're going around in a circle clockwise. So I'm going to put the four words clockwise, I'm going to match north with never, and I want you to notice why. The in goes with north, and soggy, or slimy, the s goes with south. So if you go clockwise, never eat soggy waffles, the points are north, east, south, and west. So going clockwise, never eat soggy waffles, never eat slimy worms, north, east, southwest. 
Another thing that you could do, something that I did when I was younger, was think about the map of the United States. I live over here in Southern California, and all my life I've heard, well, we're on the West Coast. And so I always associated the left side being West and the right side being East. So uh, that's another device, memory device that you could use. Now let's go on to the ordinal directions, also known as the primary intercardinal. Inter means between, and these points are right in the middle between the cardinal directions. So this one, for example, is right in between north and east, and we have a special name for that direction. So here are the ordinal directions, northeast, southeast, northwest, and southwest. So northeast would go here because it's right in the middle between north and east. Therefore, southeast would go here because it's right in the middle between south and east. And likewise, northwest being right between north and west. And you guessed it, this would be southwest. Now I just want to briefly talk about the secondary cardinal directions. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's not required. But these are points that are right in between a cardinal direction and an ordinal direction. So, for example, this would be north-northeast. It's named as such because it's right in the middle between north and northeast. So in between that would be north-northeast. What about the point between northeast and east? It would actually be east-northeast. The convention is it's the cardinal direction that comes first, east followed by the, uh, the ordinal direction northeast, same thing up here, and all the way around it goes. So these are the, um, all the secondary intercardinal directions. This is also known as a 16 wind compass because it tells 16 directions. If it didn't have the secondary intercardinal directions, it would be called an eight wind. And yes, there are 32 wins, uh, 64, 128, and such that goes beyond my mind. Here are all the directions abbreviated so that you're not writing, for example, northwest all the time. You could just abbreviate it as in W. Now, does this look a little bit familiar? Indeed, it does. It is the Royal Rangers emblem. In fact, the design of the Royal Rangers emblem is based on the points of a compass to represent the direction and pathway God has given us through his holy word. We have the um, secondary intercardinal directions as the, uh, the eight blue points of the Royal Ranger code, the four gold points of the way a boy grows, and then the four cardinal doctrines of the church, which are the red points. But let's just focus on the eight major directions and their bearings. So what are bearings? Notice that each direction is explicitly called a name. North, Southwest, East, for example. These are specific directions. Northeast is exactly in between North and East. However, there are infinitely more directions all between north and northeast. And it's impractical to give names of every single direction. So we have a more systematic way of telling directions. And those are called bearings. Now, I want you to think of a circle. How many degrees are in a circle? Well, there are 360 degrees in a circle. So if we start up here, it starts at 1, 2, 3, all the way to 90, all the way to 180, and all the way to 360. Uh, now, I couldn't find a GIF that uh, went all the way to 360 without going into the negative numbers. But if you imagine, after 180, it would go to like 181, 182, all the way around. Anyway, um, these are degrees. It's like you're dividing a circle into 360 equal pieces of pi. Okay, so we call north zero degrees. So by convention, we're just going to say this is zero degrees and we're going to go clockwise in a circle. So think about a right angle. And I'm not sure if you've seen a right angle before yet, but you'll learn about it sometime. But a right angle is one quarter of a circle, which means there are four right angles in a circle. So if a circle is 360 degrees, divide that by four and you get 90. So north, the bearing for north is zero degrees, the bearing for east is 90 degrees. 
And likewise, south is 180 degrees. If you heard about a 180, that's like you turned around. If you are doing drill commands at your outpost, you probably heard of about face, which is a 180 uh, degree turn, which means that you face the opposite direction. You turn around. You call it 180 because that's half of 360, which is a full circle. So to recap, from north to east is 90 degrees. From east to south is another 90 degree angle. From south to west is another 90 degree angle. So 180 plus 90 is 270. And now another 90 degree angle from west to north brings you up to 360. So north is the only direction that has two bearings. It could be zero degrees or 360 degrees, which is the same exact point on the circle. Okay, if northeast is exactly in between north and east, it makes sense that the bearing of northeast is half of 90, so that's 45 degrees. What about southeast? Well, from north to northeast is 45. From northeast to east, you add another 45. 45 plus 45 is 90. And then from east to southeast is another 45 degrees. So take 90 plus 45, which is 135. Another thing that you could look at is a right angle. Uh, between the ordinal directions are right angles. So from northeast to southeast is another 90 degrees. So if you take 45 and you add 90, that gives you 135. And likewise, from southeast to southwest, that's a 90 degree angle. So 135 plus 90 is 225. Also, uh, from 90 to 135 is 45 degrees. From southeast to south is another 45 degrees. From south to southwest is 45 degrees. So 180 plus 45 is 225. So there's a couple of different ways to arrive at these bearing numbers. Uh, from southwest to west is 45 degrees. So 225 plus 45 is 270, plus another 45 degrees for northwest is 315, plus another 45 is 360. So these are the bearings. So instead of saying northwest, you would say find a bearing of 315 degrees. All right. And these are uh, well defined. Uh, northeast by definition is 45 degrees. If you're going 46 degrees, that's not northeast anymore. If you're going 47 or 48 degrees, that's also not 45 degrees and therefore not northeast either. And this makes things a bit more practical because now you could say, I want to go in a bearing of 22 degrees or 218 degrees, for example. Okay, requirement four, define these terms, magnetic north, true north, declination, and magnetic variation. Now I want you to take a look at declination and magnetic variation. These mean the same thing. So declination, also known as magnetic variation. So true north. True north is the north pole or axis on which Earth rotates. So this is Earth's axis and it rotates on it. That right there, that topmost spot is true north and true south would be the opposite. Okay, magnetic north. Magnetic north is the direction of the Earth's magnetic pole, which is right here. So the true north is right here up on top and true south is down here. But magnetic north is just a little off to the side. Now, if there's magnetic north, there's magnetic south. So you have two main types of north. Here's another view of uh, the geographical north pole, also known as true north, and magnetic north. So true, true north is right here. Magnetic north is down there. And there are two different locations. Okay, I want to uh, briefly introduce magnetism here. Um, so here's a bar magnet. You probably played with magnets before, uh, maybe Thomas trains, uh, horseshoe magnets, or bar magnets. Well, magnets always have two poles. You have a north pole and you have a south pole. These lines are known as magnetic field lines, and these are invisible. But th we do science experiments with iron filaments to uh, visualize uh, these uh, magnetic field lines, or if we're drawing it out, we just draw arrows. So the magnetic field or the magnetic force 
goes from the north pole of a magnet and goes all the way to the south pole. So try and remember that. If you put a north pole and a south pole next to each other, they attract. If you put two norths or two souths next to each other, they repel. And you may have had experience with this with magnets. When you try to put magnets together, and you might get them to touch, but they're just not going to stay. And you feel this repulsive force between these two poles. Well, that's because uh, like poles repel, but opposite poles attract. Also, uh, real quick, I I'd share but if you have a bar magnet and you cut it in half that doesn't mean that now you have just a south pole and just a north pole you just created two smaller magnets with its own north and south pole and so on so that brings up declination declination or magnetic variation is the angle between true north and magnetic north Okay, so this is that image again, and let's say that you are standing right here somewhere around Maine or Vermont or New Hampshire, and you're using a compass, and you need to know where north is. Well, north is right here. That's the north pole. By definition, that is north or a zero degree bearing. However, your compass is under the influence of Earth's magnetic field. So your compass is actually going to point to magnetic north. And you would see that there's an angle between the two. That angle is called declination, and you've got to account for that because although a compass is really precise and people's lives have been dependent on a compass, if you don't account for the declination, it can be a question of life and death because if you're a couple of degrees off and you're walking uh, for a few hours, you might get lost. Okay, I want you to imagine the styrofoam ball as the Earth. And again, on Earth, you have the true north and you have the magnetic north, which I will denote as the blue tack and red tack respectively. So if you're standing right here, true north is in this direction. But your compass is going to point in that direction and that's declination. Sometimes the declination is larger and other times the declination is not at all because if you're standing right here then true north is right up there your compass is going to point toward magnetic north but in order to get to magnetic north it must pass through true north so in this case there's actually no declination but if you're just a little off to the side now you can see the declination and you have to account for it and it can be a little declination or a big declination depending on where you are on Earth. So this brings up the isogonic lines chart. So let's define some root words. Uh, gon means angle, like a polygon, for example, octagon, heptagon, and so on. Iso means the same. And a or an is a prefix meaning not or without. So isogonic line. Okay, so iso means same. Gonic refers to angle, so each of these lines that you see are isogonic lines on which the angle or declination is the same, isogonic, the same angle. So in other words, if you're standing anywhere on this line where it says 10 degrees west, the declination is the same by 10 degrees, and we'll talk more about that later. If you're standing right here in Northern California, then the declination is 15 degrees and it's the same declination all the way on this line. Now the agonic line is a special type of isogonic line on which there is no declination whatsoever. The declination is zero degrees. Now real quick, why does it say east over here and west over there when this is the west coast and that's the east coast? It just means that these isogonic lines are pointed in the easterly direction and these isogonic lines are pointed in the westerly declination right here. So once you know the declination, you either have to add or subtract from the bearing that you're given. So let's say that your commander tells you to find a bearing of 225 degrees. Well, if you're standing over here in northwestern uh, Washington, the declination is 20 degrees east. 
So that means you either have to add or subtract 20 degrees from the bearing that you are given. Now how do you know when to add and when to subtract? When I teach this, I tell my boys at Rangers to think of a number line. Okay, and I lined up zero degrees with zero right here on the number line. Now on a number line, you know you have the positive numbers on the right and the negative numbers to the left. So I want you to visualize a big minus sign on the left and a big plus sign on the right. So this should remind you that if you are west of the agonic line, which is this that I'm outlining here, you must subtract the declination. If you are east of the agonic line, you must add the declination. So let's say that you're standing right here in Pennsylvania with a 10 degree west declination and your commander tells you to find a bearing of 270 degrees. Well, if you have a 10 degrees west declination, you must add 10 degrees to it. So instead of 270 degrees, you add 10, which is 280 degrees. And that's to account for uh, the angle between true north and magnetic north. And if you do so, you would be heading toward true north now instead of magnetic north. So let's do a practice real quick. Let's say that you're east of the agonic line where there's a seven degree declination. What would you set your compass to if I told you to find a bearing of 263 degrees? Okay, so it says that you're east of the agonic line. The agonic line is right here where there's no declination. So you don't have to worry about adding or subtracting here. But you're east of the agonic line, which means that you're on this side. If you're on this side, Think about the number line. Think about the positive numbers being on this side of zero, so you add. So if you're told to find a bearing of 263 degrees, you add the declination, which is seven degrees. 263 plus seven is 270, so you must set your compass to a bearing of 270 degrees. What cardinal direction has a bearing of 270 degrees? This is for view west. So when I taught the compass mirror the last time, every week I would do a simple practice problem just to jog their memory. And then soon I would take away the number line and eventually this poster. But let's say that you're standing right here in the middle of Texas. What is the declination there? It's not 5 degrees and it's not 10 degrees, but it's somewhere between 5 and 10 degrees. To be accurate, and you need to be accurate, I would advise you to go to this website right here. I'll leave a link in the description below and you could put in your longitude and latitude and it will tell you what your current declination is. Now notice I say current declination. In fact, the magnetic north pole moves, unfortunately. So in 1850, the magnetic north was right here and in 2010, it was up here. So that means if you're using a map, you have to really pay attention to what year that map was printed. If it was like a map from the 70s, 80s, 90s, it's really not going to help you when you're using a compass because the declination is off. Now I want to give just a, a brief history of the compass and magnetism very briefly. So this is called the lodestone, which is from the mineral magnetite. And the stone has magnetic properties to it. So lodestone means leading stone or coarse stone. And according to the story that I was taught, uh, thousands of years ago, sailors would uh, discover this and use it to tell direction because the stone being like a, a magnet would point to north and they would suspend this stone on a rope and use it kind of bit like as a navigation tool. And this was kind of bit the precursor to, to using a compass. Back thousands of years ago, sailors would use the stars, but sometimes it's uh, it was a cloudy night. And we'll talk about um, astro navigation a little later. Um, sometimes they would look at the land, but sometimes it was too foggy or they were too far from land and such, and they needed something a bit reliable. So the lodestone was used to point to north and so that they would be able to navigate. Okay, so this is Earth, and Earth has that magnetic field around it. 
So Earth kind of acts like a big bar magnet where you have two poles, a North Pole and a South Pole. Now I want you to remember that image that I showed you earlier about the bar magnet with the lines going out. The lines are a certain direction, so I just put a few of them here, and this was what I was just referring to. And remember what I said earlier, that the magnetic field lines go from the North Pole to the South Pole. Now something I didn't tell you, if you were to put a compass right next to a bar magnet, the arrows actually point to where the magnetic needle would point to. So if you're standing like right here, then the magnetic needle on the compass is going to point in that direction toward the magnetic north. But remember what I said, magnetic field lines go from the north to the south. Do you know what that means? It means that our north pole is really a south pole and our south pole is really North Pole. So our magnetic North Pole is really a South Pole, but by convention we call it the magnetic North because it's close to the North Pole. Anyway, the last couple of times I taught the compass merit to my boys over the years, I uh, said that and they were really blown away by that. Okay, requirement five, demonstrate how to orient your compass. So now we're going to learn how to actually use a compass properly. So here's how you orient a compass. First, Rotate the housing so that the north is lined up with the direction of travel arrow. Next, stand up straight and hold the compass up next to your side. But make sure the compass is away from anything metal, like your belt loop or perhaps a table or something that has metal to it. Because the magnetic needle is going to be under the influence of any metal that is surrounding it. So you don't want that. But just keep this down to your side a little away from your body and look down at it and you hold it flat like this. Not like this or like that but just like this and then you're going to pivot or rotate your entire body until the magnetic needle is inside the orienting arrow or pointing to the end. Remember in this compass it doesn't really show the orienting arrow but again the orienting arrow is an arrow that's inside the housing and points to the north in the housing. In this case it has two long lines that glow in the dark right here. So that represents the point of the orienting arrow right there. And you want to turn until the magnetic needle is inside the orienting arrow. And therefore you oriented the compass and you're now facing north. And there are some fancy compasses out there where you could adjust for declination. And now on to requirement six, demonstrate how to find a bearing. Let's say that you're asked to find a bearing of 40 degrees. And just for the sake of simplicity, let's say that you're on the agonic line, you don't have to worry about declination. So this is what you do. You look inside the housing and you find 40 degrees. You rotate the housing until the 40 degrees is lined up with the direction of travel arrow because you want to point in that direction and then head in that direction. That's the purpose of finding a bearing. Okay, once that's set up, you hold it as if you're orienting your, the compass down to your side, away from metal, flat like this. And then you rotate your body until the magnetic needle is inside the orienting arrow. There's also a mnemonic red in the shed where the orienting arrow is the shed and the magnetic needle is the red. But sometimes the magnetic needle is green or another color, but the principle is to get the magnetic needle inside the orienting arrow. In other words, the magnetic needle is pointing to the north on the compass inside the housing. And if this weighs north and you're going clockwise in degrees, this is 40 degrees from north. So this is a bearing of 40 degrees in this direction. And you will find a siding point, which we'll talk about later, and you, will, you would walk toward it. Let's say that you're asked to find a bearing of 235 degrees. Well, you should rotate the housing so that 235 is in line with the direction of travel arrow. So if this is 220 and that's 240, then the tick mark halfway would be 230. And then you would just rotate a little bit between 230 and 240, and then that should be around 235. And now you would rotate your body until the magnetic needle is inside the orienting arrow. Just like that. Or pointing to the end right here. 
and now the direction of travel arrow is pointing at that direction of 235 degrees. One other thing is always keep the direction of travel arrow pointed away from you at all times. Okay, requirement seven. Give a good example of a sighting point. So let's say that you find a bearing. You find a bearing and you look down at the compass and you start walking where the direction of travel arrow is pointing and then you keep your head down well you're going to bump into things. If you select a siding point you could just walk to it so here's what you do you find a bearing and then you point it in that direction and you look up and you see a stationary object that is conspicuous or something that stands out and it could be a tree, it could be a mountain, it could be a fence post as long as it's stationary like it can't be your commander, it can't be a bird, it can't be a cloud but just something in that direction and then you walk to it and then we take a bearing and then select a different sighting point uh, beyond that and so on. So that's the purpose of sighting points. Requirement 8. List three methods for estimating distances and tell which is the most accurate method. So the first one is timing. This is when you know how far away a location is and you want to estimate how long it'll take to arrive there. You've got to know your walking speed. So for instance, if you walk four miles per hour and your destination is two miles away, how long will it take? Well, after one hour, you'd walk four miles. So if your destination is two miles, it would only take a half hour, so 30 minutes. If you're walking in rough terrain, your walking speed will probably be slowed. If you feel that you're walking half your speed in rough terrain, then you're walking probably at two miles per hour and therefore, how long would it take to go two miles? It would be one hour. If you're walking two miles per hour, to walk two miles, it would take one hour. Next is mental measurements. This method is when you estimate how far away something is by taking what you are familiar with and applying it to unfamiliar places. For instance, if you know that from your house to your school is a half mile away, then you should have a good idea how far away a half mile is. So for example, if you know that from your house to the fire station, let's just say it's 200 yards, then you have a good idea of how far 200 yards away is. Or from your house to your school, or let's say a farther school, let's say it's one mile, you would have a good idea of how far one mile is. Another thing is a football field. A football field is 100 yards between the goal lines. So if you're standing high up somewhere and looking down, you could visualize like let's say two football fields. If you could visualize two football fields next to each other, that's 200 yards. So you could estimate distances using mental measurements by applying what you're familiar with to unfamiliar places, thereby estimating how far away something is, and then using timing to figure out approximately how long it would take to get there. The next method is stepping. If you know your average step, you can take the amount of steps you take, multiply it by your average step, and estimate the distance. And just to say this is the most accurate. So requirement nine, calculate your average step and average stride using the step method. So to calculate average step, lay out 100 feet in a straight path. Count how many steps it takes. Divide 100 by the number of steps. So you take 100 and you divide it by the number of steps and this is your average step. Average stride is double your average step. So if your average step ends up being 2.3, then your average stride is 4.6. Now I've heard average stride being two different definitions. It's two steps or one long stride. Knowing both could help you as you estimate distance. So if your average step is 2.2 feet per step and you go 100 steps, you take 2.2 and you multiply by 100 and that means that the distance that you walked in 100 steps is 220 feet. A quick story about average stride. Back when I was teaching the astronomy merit in 2015, I needed 33 feet for a scale model of the solar system from the sun to Pluto. And I wasn't sure with the dimensions if that would be 33 feet. So I thought, take the hypotenuse. 
or, or the diagonal. And before I was going to do so, a commander came up to me asking what I was doing. I explained what I was doing and that I needed 33 feet and I'm wondering if this diagonal would, uh, would do it. So he stood at the corner where I was and took a bunch of strides and said, oh yeah, this is 33 feet because I have a three foot stride and I took 10 or 11 steps or strides. So that's one application of knowing your average stride. If your average step is two feet and you need to pace off 20 feet, then that's 10 steps because 10 times two is 20. And that's another application to using your average step. Or let's say that you want to measure the edge of a building or wherever or whatever, and you know your average step, all you have to do is just walk the length, count the number of steps and multiply it by your average step. And that's approximately how long it is in feet. Okay, requirement 10. Demonstrate how to determine direction without a compass using the following. The face of a standard watch. So this is an analog wristwatch, which means that it has the hands. But if you have a digital watch, then you could estimate where the hands would be. So you hold it flat like a compass, and the method that I'm going to show you works if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. And then if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, I'll explain that here shortly. So turn the watch so that the hour hand lines up with the sun. So the hour hand points to the sun. Now visualize another line from the center of the watch through the 12, just like this, and it makes an angle. Now bisect that angle, which all that means is cut it in two, and then you have a north-south line. So if you make an angle between the hour hand and the 12, and you cut it in two, and then put a line right in the middle, that's going to be the north-south line, where the angle opens up to south and the opposite would be north and from north and south you could determine east and west remember never eat slimy worms north east south west so what if it's daylight savings time that's between the second sunday in march and the first sunday in november all they have to do instead of drawing a line from the center through the 12 it's from the center through the one so it's kind of like adding an hour and after the second Sunday in March, you spring forward, so you add an hour, if you want to think about it that way, and then that creates another north-south line. So it's the same as before, you bisect this angle into two smaller angles that are equal, and that becomes your north-south line, where the angle opens up toward the direction of the south. So you have uh, north, east, south, west. Now compared to what it is if it's not daylight savings time, so you could tell that there's like a declination here. You want to be accurate when using a compass, so make sure that you know when it's daylight savings time, otherwise you would be a couple of degrees off. Now, suppose you're in the southern hemisphere. Well, in that case, you want to point the 12 at the sun, not the hour hand this time and then draw another line from the center through the hour hand like this. And then this becomes your north-south line. However, this time the angle opens up to the north and the opposite would be south. So never eat slimy worms, north, east, south, and west. So that's what it would be like in the Southern hemisphere. And um, of course, if it's daylight savings time, you point the one toward the sun. This time, just add an hour, and that's how you do it. Next is the stars. This is a famous asterism slash constellation known as the Little Dipper, or Ursa Minor. And this right here is the North Star, called Polaris, or the Pole Star. And this is very special, because no matter what time of the year it is, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you should be able to see Polaris. And here's how you find it. If you could see the Big Dipper, then you look at these two pointer stars, uh, Merrick and Duby, and you follow it as it points to Polaris. So you take the two pointer stars and it points to Polaris, and then you could find the Little Dipper. But again, why is this important in astro navigation? It's because, again, all year round, Polaris and the Little Dipper is going to stay around the same spot. And Polaris itself, that star, the North Star, is going to stay at the same spot all year round. So this GIF right here represents 
a year going by. So if you go out at the same time every night and, and uh, take a picture and make a GIF, this is what you would see for one year. So how does this work? Recall that the North Pole is the top of the axis on which Earth rotates and right above the North Pole or that axis is the pole star or Polaris. And that's why Polaris stays in the same spot all year round. And here's a bonus method. If you take a stick and you put it on the ground, it's going to cast a shadow. The first shadow is going to be right here. So at the edge of the stick's shadow, you would put something like a rock. And then you would wait about 10, 15, 20 minutes and the sun is going to come over here and the shadow is going to move. You put a second rock or whatever right here. And then you take a step where the toes are right here and the uh, heel is back here. And then if you extend your right arm, that's due north. And if that's north, you could figure out the other directions, north, east, south, and west. Something else to note is that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And so there's a saying, evening shadows point east. So if it's evening, then the sun is at the west side and all the shadows are going to point in the easter, uh, easterly direction. And the opposite's true in the morning. And in the afternoon around 11, 12, 1 o'clock, uh, the shadows will be smaller, but the sun will be in the south in the northern hemisphere at noon. Okay, requirement 11. Demonstrate your understanding of a topographic map, also known as a topo map, by doing the following. First of all, let's have an uh, introduction to topo maps. Let's say that you're in the mountain ranges and you want to take these three dimensional mountains and map it out in a two dimensional map, something like this, but at the same time denote its elevation. That's what topo maps represent. They represent elevation. So to help that sink in, let's let me show you this graphic right here. These topo map representations represent these mountains right here. So for the steep mountain, it starts at 1440 feet above sea level and it extends beyond 1840 or 1840 feet. Notice that the elevations are increasing by 80 foot increments. For instance, from 1440 feet to 1520 feet is 80 feet. So what the map makers do is they take the mountains and they divide it in increments, in this case 80 foot increments. Down here is again 1440 feet above sea level and if you were to go all the way around the mountain and look down at it, this is what the shape would be. So that means everything inside here is at least 1440 feet and then the next increment is 1520 feet and there's not a lot of the mountain that's 1520 feet above sea level compared to 1440 feet. So that's that little line right here. So the second contour line, as they call it, is representing 1520 feet, inside of which the rest of the mountain is above 1520 feet. The third line that you see inside here represents 1600 feet and so on all the way to the top. So this little piece right here, which is above 1,840 feet, is this right here. Some mountains are not that tall, so you wouldn't see anything um, inside that contour line. This would represent the, the summit inside here. Something that we could tell from topo maps is the steepness of the mountain, if it's steep or if it's not as steep. The closer the contour lines are, the steeper it is. So if you could imagine this little piece right here represents the same elevation as this right over here, if I'm doing a decent job drawing this. So this represents an 80 foot incline. So does this. Same thing here. From here to here represents 80 feet. But from on the other side, from here to there also represents 80 feet. So the same vertical distance is like stretched out right here versus over here. So this is more steep, which means that it's probably going to be tougher to climb versus this side over here. 
So on the topo map, you have contour lines and standard elevations, which you can see right here, all of these lines, again, they're called contour lines. Those are typically drawn out using brown. Okay, water, lake, stream, spring, marsh, water tanks. I mean, what's the standard color for water in illustrations? Blue. And you can see that right here, you can see a couple of lakes and streams or rivers. Okay, major vegetation such as forest, brush, and orchard. Well, what's the color of grass or the leaves on a lot of trees? Green. Highways and boundaries. Those are usually denoted in red. Man-made structures and place names, buildings, roads, trails, bridges, railroads. Black. Absence of major vegetation, such as prairies, meadows, farms, and fields. White. Okay, demonstrate your ability to read a topo map. So go to your commander and he will probably give you this activity and these questions right here. And all you have to do is use the map to answer the questions. Okay, demonstrate your ability to identify topo map symbols and draw and label 10 topo map symbols from memory. So we're going to take a look at topo map symbols right now and I want you to memorize at least 10 of them and go to your commander thereafter. Okay, so here are some topo map symbols. Let's start with this first one right here. This is a highway. Next is good road. And after that is private or bad road, which is why it's dashed. This right here represents a single railroad track. And if that's a single railroad track, then this is a double railroad track. This dashed line here represents a path or a trail. This represents a stream and a dam. Next, this represents an orchard, followed by evergreen trees. This represents a bridge, a stone wall, grass, and a marsh. Okay, up here, this represents a U.S. route, and below it is a state route. These represent buildings, and this represents a school because it has a flag on top. This is a church because it has a cross on top. And then this one represents a cemetery. Here are telephone poles and power lines. This right here is a tennis court, and this right here is a baseball diamond. And then finally, you have mountain ranges. Okay, describe what to do if you get lost. The first step is pray for God's help. Don't panic, stay where you are. Look for landmarks like towers, mountains, trees, etc. Mark your trail if you must move to an area with better shelter. And it's also good if you tell people where you're going and how long you're going to be out for before you leave for the adventure. Leave notes. Keep visible to aircraft. And there's like uh, reflector mirrors. And also um, you could build fires. Usually things in threes represents an emergency, like three fires, three blows of a whistle, etc. Build or find shelter. Don't wait until dark. So you could build a primitive shelter. You could also use tarp if you have it, tarp and rope or a cord. Build a fire. Find water and make sure that you purify it. Uh, one of the most common ways to purify water is through boiling. Make rescue signals such as flares and again, uh, whistles, uh, you could blow in sequences of three, and that is a sign of distress. And search for food. Okay, requirement 13. List three scripture references regarding features on a map, such as rivers, mountains, trees, highways, and cities. Uh, let me introduce you to the concordance if you don't know what it is already. The concordance is a place where you have keywords, names, locations, and, and other keywords, and tells you a biblical reference that uses that word. 
Additional keywords to consider uh, beyond these up here include vineyard, garden, road, trees, path, etc. Okay, and finally, requirement 14. Successfully complete the compass skills activity provided by your leader. So this is a fun activity where you get to put the knowledge and the skills of using a compass to practice. So congratulations, you got an excellent start on the compass merit. The next step is to show your commander the notes and do the uh, couple of additional requirements uh, needed from the merit and you should be good to go and good job. Thank you.